Nintendo announced a full year's delay for the sequel to Breath of the Wild, and with at least a full six years of development time, there will be no excuses for any parts of the game that fall short. Good morning, good Thursday morning to you, I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for March 31st, 2022. The show is in our patrons' feeds bright and early every weekday morning, and free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You can find our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service. You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. So, the sequel to Breath of the Wild has been delayed once again to spring of 2023. Yes, a full year from now. It's hard to believe Nintendo was ever serious about its 2022 release date when it's been pushed back just three months into the year. Zelda producer Ig Enuma broke the bad news, claiming in order to make the game's experience something special, the team is working hard. But no specific reason for the delay was given. After the announcement, he went on to remind us how it's a game that takes place both on the ground and in the skies. Is that an excuse for why it's being delayed? Or a hint that it's a lot like Skyward Sword? Neither option is ideal. If the game does indeed release next spring, it will have been a massive six-year gap between Breath of the Wild and its sequel. Let's just be honest, it is going to be compared to God of War Ragnarok, and that's totally fair. If God of War comes out this year, as it's currently scheduled, it will have only been in development for four years. Even if it's delayed to 2023 like Zelda, it will have only been in development for five years. Of particular concern is Zelda's storytelling, or the lack thereof in the first Breath of the Wild. A lot of critics and fans gave the game a pass in this regard, but it will be a whole lot harder to do that in 2023. For example, From Software released Sekiro in 2019 and followed up with Elden Ring just three years later, and just five years after the release of Dark Souls 3. It managed to release two games in five years, with one being called The Next Evolution of the Breath of the Wild Open World. So. Breath of the Wild sequel will also be compared to that. In my opinion, Nintendo needs to shift its focus on how it develops open world Zelda games and craft them so that normal fans can enjoy them a lot more. The amount of work that goes into allowing hardcore players to cobble together working machines from the game's objects and physics is really neat, but it's something that less than 10% of its players will ever fiddle with or even really know that it exists. The game needs legitimate dungeons, some semblance of modern storytelling, and weapons that don't break every five minutes. I don't want Nintendo to miss the forest for the trees here, which is my big concern with yet another delay for the game. A lot has changed in the last five years of open world video games, and if Nintendo has delayed the game to work on the little things, instead of addressing all the elephants in the room, it will be extremely disappointing. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. In one of the more disappointing announcements so far in 2022, the revamp of Sony subscription services has finally been confirmed. Codenamed Spartacus, the details mostly align with the earlier leaks. Starting in June, PlayStation Plus will be available as a three-tiered service, including Essential, Extra, and Premium tiers. The relaunched service will combine the existing PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now services, as well as offer even more content, such as a catalog of classic games from the original PlayStation, PlayStation 2, and PSP generations. Essential is basically the current PlayStation Plus, with no change to the price, unless you pay monthly, and then it's 10 bucks a month, which adds up to double what you would pay if you paid for it annually. And by the way, those annual subscriptions, according to PlayStation, are going to remain in place. Extra is $100 per year and includes up to 400 PS4 and PS5 games for downloadable play. The third premium tier for $120 adds another 340 games from the PS1, PS2, and PSP, plus the PlayStation 3, but only via the cloud. It also includes PlayStation Now, which means game streaming and time-limited game trials. The service is supposed to launch with Death Stranding, God of War from 2018, Marvel's Spider-Man, 
Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales, Mortal Kombat 11, and Returnal. However, PlayStation has already shared that it has no plans of releasing its exclusive first-party games day and date on the new PlayStation Plus service. For all intents and purposes, PlayStation Now is dead. The name is dead, the brand is dead, it's been rolled into PlayStation Plus, and this new tiered system for PlayStation Plus has no chance of competing with Game Pass. In yet another feel-good story, in a year where we could use a lot more of them, Fortnite has now raised over $100 million for Ukraine. The Battle Royale shooter has hit yet another huge milestone, and with the influx, it's now donating to World Central Kitchen in addition to its previous charities. Epic Games was also hit with another lawsuit over Fortnite dance moves this week, except this time the complainant, Kyle Hanagami, actually has a copyright on the disputed move. Holding a copyright to dance moves is only part of the legal battle, though. Dance copyrights are notoriously complicated, leaving wide areas for creative expression that are still fair game. Legal and artistic concepts like creative use, in addition to the choreography, play important roles. Generally speaking, a dance work that violates a copyright must be found to copy most of the original work rather than just a few moves or one section of it. Generally, copywriting dance moves is absurd. As someone who's been a part of the dance music scene and culture for over 25 years, I haven't seen a single new dance move in the last 15 years. I'm not kidding. Dance moves should not be allowed to be copywritten. But at least the courts aren't too keen to side with the people who try to take advantage of other dancers' apathy. Kyle Hanagami, you suck. We got confirmation today of the free games for both Xbox Live and PlayStation Plus for April 2022. On the Xbox side, the Xbox One games are Another Sight and Hue, while on Xbox 360, you get Outpost Koloki X and MX vs. ATV Alive. On PlayStation Plus, you get Hood, Outlaws, and Legends, SpongeBob SquarePants, Battle for Bikini Bottom, and Slay the Spire. All of these games launch on April 5th, as we see both Xbox and PlayStation move away from the annual cost just to play games online. The selection of free games that you get with those programs have continued their slide towards terrible. What is quickly becoming the world's most popular battle royale shooter, and certainly the fastest growing battle royale shooter, is now available for both PS5 and Xbox Series X. Yes, that's right, Apex Legend finally has gone next gen. Respawn's battle royale is getting a next gen upgrade with 4K 60 frames per second gameplay, greater level of detail distances, HDR, and so much more. Coming in the future is 120Hz mode, PS5 haptics for the DualSense controller, and much more improvements, but no date has been announced for that stuff. Today marks the launch of Intel's Arc A series graphics cards, the company's first discrete graphics cards to go head-to-head against industry titans AMD and Nvidia. Right now, they're only for laptops, but they do feature support for the full DirectX 12 Ultimate feature set, including ray tracing, VRS, mesh shading, and sampler feedback, plus direct storage and XESS AI upscaling. That actually puts them on keel with NVIDIA in terms of most features, and ahead of AMD, which doesn't yet have a temporal upscaling solution. Intel's also shared a look at its new software center called Control. Much like NVIDIA's GeForce experience, it helps you manage driver updates and performance. There was also another look at the upcoming desktop GPUs in all It's an impressive first step for Intel. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's Boss Fight, where I tackle random topics that may, or may not be, related to video games. So it's been a little over two months since Microsoft's surprise acquisition of Activision Blizzard for a tidy fee of 68.7 billion USD. It was announced on January 18th, and so I figure it's a good time to kind of check in on the publisher of Call of Duty, Overwatch, Diablo, Warcraft, Candy Crush, and more, 
to see how this purchase has changed its behaviors, if at all. Since the announcement, Microsoft has shared what it believes its new org chart will be for its massive gaming division. And it is massive now after all these acquisitions. However, Bobby Kotick, CEO and figurehead for Activision Blizzard, is nowhere to be seen in the new Microsoft Gaming org chart. Many in the gaming community believe he should step down for his role, but regardless of how he leaves, he's leaving with nearly a half a billion dollar golden parachute. Activision Blizzard is supposed to operate autonomously until around June 2023 when the deal finally goes through, but we've already seen hints that this simply isn't happening. Again, it's been just a little over two months since the purchase was announced, and we've already seen Activision Blizzard do things it never would have done on its own. For starters, it's not releasing a new Call of Duty next year. I'll repeat, there is not a new Call of Duty coming out in 2023. There is no way this would have ever happened if the publisher were still responsible to its shareholders for its financial performance. And if somehow the deal is shut down by regulators, it could end very, very badly. Since the purchase, there have also been allegations of insider trading among Kodak's friends, a new Call of Duty studio opened in Montreal, Warzone has been announced for mobile, QA testers went on strike, and it was announced that Call of Duty and other popular Activision Blizzard IP will continue to be released on PlayStation platforms, which really upset the Xbox fanboys who thought they were going to have these properties all to themselves. And then, just this week, Activision Blizzard settled its notorious sexual harassment lawsuit for just 18 million USD. The company was just sold for almost 70 billion and it paid just 18 million for its horrible previous transgressions. It's the second largest settlement in Equal Employment Opportunity Commission history, but it's just a drop in the bucket for Activision. According to the Washington Post, the settlement could prevent the DFEH, which is also pursuing legal action against Activision Blizzard, from seeking further monetary damages because, as part of this settlement, sexual harassment has been removed from any future proceedings. This means the settlement could be a loss for both the DFEH's case and sexual harassment victims of the company because state agency has historically been more aggressive than federal proceedings like that of the EEOC. Last October, Communications Workers of America also fought an objection against the then possible settlement with the EEOC. In the labor union's view, $18 million or just $450 per claimant is a drop in the bucket for Activision Blizzard. And like I said, I agree. Especially when the publisher paid $150 million to Bobby Kotick in 2020. In fact, leaving Activision Blizzard will reportedly give Kotick a payout of $390 million USD, which is an enormous amount of money for a man who received a vote of no confidence from 1,200 of his employees. So where does this all leave Activision? To be frank, it appears that corporate has essentially thrown up its hands and is writing things out until the deal is finally sealed. For the creatives at the publisher, it feels like there's been a sigh of relief along with business as usual. The development teams continue to plug forward, as evidenced by a Diablo 4 environmental art developer diary that was just released today as the representation of its quarterly report. It focuses on the over 150 handcrafted yet procedurally generated dungeons, and Blizzard claims there isn't much else to show until the public plays it, which we presume should be very soon. Overwatch 2 also received a developer update video in early March that announced a closed alpha and its system requirements, so it also sounds like it's moving forward full steam ahead. Even World of Warcraft has continued to launch new content since the announcement, so while everything sounds like it's moving along creatively, the corporate side of the publisher has essentially disappeared. After what's happened over the last couple years, it's probably for the best. So generally, everything that's happened since the announcement has really been good. The developers who have been on the Call of Duty squirrel wheel for basically the last two decades can finally step off and take a Dramamine before getting back on. That never would have happened unless this deal had been made. And the other studios are still on target, they are still hitting their development milestones, and really, it's just business as usual. As long as Bobby Kotick and his upper management cronies stay out of the way, it looks like this acquisition is going to work out great for everyone.
Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. Follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize today because there will never be another. <laughs>